manage to deal with that number of species so quickly with a number of people, you know, that's pretty much this list plus a couple of others. How, how, what what trade-offs are you, what are you doing, and what are the trade-offs associated with be, doing this thing so quickly? And presumably, so, so less documentation. I assume I don't have to repeat the question. He's got a loud voice. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> uh, okay, so basically, I mean, that, that hierarchical approach is part of the answer, Andre, that, that you start with, uh, with a sort of a rapid assessment that's pretty qualitative. I mean, that it, don't underestimate, there, there was a lot of resources went into this, and Nick can probably attest to that. It was a five-year process. Um, it, it involved a lot of stakeholder engagement, which was just about what killed us in the end, because we were dealing with 20 different fisheries. Uh, the documentation is not unimpressive. Um, you know, it runs to uh, probably uh, well, it's well over a thousand pages anyway. You know, one of the key elements in this is that um, you want to be transparent about what you've done, and so you need to justify the, de the, the decisions you've made at various points along the way. So there's, there, there was a fair bit of work went into this, but I agree relative to to um, perhaps what I've seen of. Um, NEPA and, and some of its requirements in the US, this was a relatively um, benign process. It didn't always feel that way when you're in the middle of it. Uh, Anne. This, the, your vulnerability is... Um, mm. uh, uh, susceptibility. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, so susceptibility, productivity. Yeah, it's, I mentioned in our part of the world, uh, that's a great concept, but the susceptibility part that you're able to either quantify catch or and that you know something about the biomass and are there fisheries or stocks in Australia where you're missing one of those because of course that is a shark and what do you do well no the answer is we deliberately at that second this was still the second level in, right. the, in the hierarchy um, we were dealing with stocks where we hadn't maybe some information on catch, no information on, on biomass or any trend date or anything like right. that, no assessments. So what we were really looking at was those, those four elements of susceptibility in particular, which was the, you know, the, what, what's the spatial overlap, you know, what's the exposure to risk in the, in the, of, of this species to this fishery. Um, and uh, so, we were able to come up with enough information to assess that. There was no pretense that we were estimating a fishing mortality rate or anything like that. It was just saying these species, this group of species here, has low productivity and is exposed to the fishery in, against these sort of criteria. So it, it did actually allow us to... I mean, you've got to think of this whole process, as I said, almost like a triage process. So it's not necessarily that you accept that that's good enough and you stop at that point. Um, but uh, along the way, it, it screens out a lot of things that you probably shouldn't be worrying about. And I guess that's the point. Yeah, Martin? Um, yeah. Oh, we out of time? Yes, we're out of time. Thanks, Tony. It's great. And uh, to move along, and again, we'll have time for more discussion in the panel section um, after our, our last speaker for the section, Andrew Constable. And his talk is Emerging Approaches for Ecosystem Based Management on Forage Species. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, firstly, uh, thanks to uh, Tim and Andre for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, it's always a great privilege to be able to step outside of the Camelar environment and talk to some new people, and this is one of those opportunities. Um, I'm from the Antarctic Climate and Ecosystems Cooperative Research Centre, and most of my work now is dealing with climate change. So this is sort of a past life in transition to a new life. Um, one of the things that I've been working with for some time now is how to erect a management procedure for krill fisheries, so the forage species. Um, but the work in Camelar is a product of many people's work and not just mine. So I'm really reporting on behalf of the uh, scientific community involved with Camelar. 
I predate PowerPoint, so this is what I was told I needed to do just for presentations. Um, and here is my outline. I want to provide a context, and in fact, I'm going to probably spend a lot of time on context. Uh, context is everything in the international in arena. Uh, then I'm going to talk about Camelot. Um, we didn't have the term ecosystem-based management. I'm just going to be talking about the objectives of Camelot and how we're trying to interpret those. And then spend, if I have enough time, some of the detail on developing the cruel management procedure. There's a lot of other bits of Camelot which I'd love to give presentations on, uh, but I don't have the time to do that. So the Antarctic Marine Ecosystem. What does it look like? What does that provide for us in the way of fisheries and for conservation? Um, this is a fairly complicated diagram, but the key things to note is this red line, which is the Antarctic polar front, and that's more or less the boundary of the Camelot area. It separates the water masses from the north from those in the south, and the productivity of the waters in the south. The other key thing to note here is this purple line, which is the advance of sea ice uh, during winter. It's the maximum sea ice extent. And that's a profound governing feature of the Southern Ocean. It limits fisheries and where they can go, and it also is an important feature in terms of the productivity of the environment and also the interaction of the higher predators uh, with the fish and krill and so forth there. And they're the two main things to think about when we're trying to understand how to manage um, the activities in the region uh, in an ecosystem manner. The other thing to note is that there's the um, bounded by these, uh, the red line and this green line is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which gives you a non-stop stream of water going around the Antarctic. And again, that's an important linking feature in the environment, which gives a great connectivity between locations, but there is enough change between locations that we have to take account of the sorts of spatial structures that occur. This gives you an idea of about the spatial variability. Don't concentrate too much, except on the variation in colour. It's a sea whiffs, uh, chlorophyll uh, image, but you can see that um, it's not the same all around, and the main areas of productivity are here in the southwest Atlantic, and that's where the main focus for things like whaling, sealing, uh, fin fishing, and krill fishing have been uh, for the last uh, two centuries. Uh, and then you have other areas of interest, such as around the Ross Sea, and also these uh, places in eastern Antarctica. The krill fishery, which is what I'm going to be talking about mostly, uh, concentrates on the krill that occur in the Antarctic Peninsula and South Atlantic region, where we have the greatest abundances of krill. There's less krill here in eastern Antarctica, but again, it's a region of interest to the fishery. And then we have a food web. What's great about the Antarctic is that it is a comparatively simple system compared to the systems we've heard about already. And also, it's a comparatively <coughs> simple system in terms of the types of activities that we're trying to manage. That's a key feature, but what's different is that we're in an international environment that requires consensus, and that's a great impediment to any progress that we might make in the area. So let's just talk again a little bit more about context here, and that is we're trying to deal with a system where we don't have much data at all. It's very patchy, there's very few time series of data. The best time series of data is the fisheries and whaling and sealing data, but even that's fairly poor uh, for most of the record. So what we're trying to do then is trying to manage the ecosystem, and here's the ecosystem, uh, manage uh, what's going on there and uh, achieving some conservation objectives where we have a fishery, uh, exploiting a population, and we're all familiar with these kinds of diagrams. And there are various incentives, uh, investment and benefits governing those fisheries. We know that through the public and governments and so forth, we can define our objectives rel relative to the fishery and to the ecosystem. And we can collect lots of data. And you've seen all these diagrams before. Data on the ecosystem itself, catch data, and also particularly data on exploited populations. And Tony's already described well what a management strategy is or a management procedure. So out of these uh, matching the objectives and your estimation of status, you come up with some decisions about how to manage the fishery. In the international environment, the key thing about being able to manage successfully according to your objectives is that you actually can establish regulations. If you have an inability to regulate uh, in a complete manner, uh, then all of this other stuff is irrelevant. Uh, and so one of the key things there is how can you create 
an organisation which is reasonably responsive to the data that it's being obtained, but also responsive to the political environment, so as you can effectively regulate fisheries to achieve conservation and other objectives for the ecosystem. And that's the challenge, or has been the challenge in Camelot now for um, 29 um, years. The other thing that's come up in recent times is that it's not just the costs um, associated with fishing, but it's also the amenity value that you might wish to fish in the future, and how can you manage and take account of that? And that's particularly true in the international environment, as Jake referred to uh, this morning, uh, to do with UNCLOS and the, the balancing the right to fish and the uh, desire to conserve the ecosystem and with the WSSD and so forth, the intergenerational equity becomes a very important point. The difficulty in the international arena is that you have great uncertainty, very little data, and you've also got to take account of the spatial patchwork of environments that you experience and how you can manage across that when you don't have much control except by negotiating with other countries about how you achieve that uh, is quite problematic and has been problematic for Camelot. So let's move on to Camelot. What does it do? There's three main articles of Camelot which are important for our discussions today. The first article, Article 1, is about, well, what are you trying to conserve? You're trying to conserve what's affectionately known as Antarctic marine living resources, but it is, it is defined in Article 1 as being all species um, that are part of the Antarctic marine ecosystem uh, and contribute to the dynamics of that system. Uh, and so that's basically everything. <coughs> the objective is conservation, and that's different to every, every other regional organisation in the international arena. It has a primary objective, which is conservation, and within that is included rational use, and I'll get onto that in a moment. Whereas for other uh, international uh, conventions, uh, it's the reverse, where you might have fisheries, and then through more recent agreements, in the last, particularly in the last 10 years, uh, 15 years, uh, you have the inclusion of conservation objectives. And that's been quite hard, because you have to adapt uh, the organisation to conservation objectives, whereas we began with that. The main component then to do with fisheries is this conservation includes rational use. And it's considered to be rational when you can maintain productivity and the ecology of the system. That if you stop fishing, the system would return to the natural norms within 20 to 30 years. And then lastly, because of whaling and sealing in the region, there's a provision for the restoration of, of those populations. And that's, that's what rational use is. Within that, you can uh, do what you like. Uh, the difficulty is we do have to define uh, some of these concepts, and that's what I'd like to talk about in this talk. So the area being managed is within this uh, red boundary, and what we have is the krill fishery currently concentrating in the southwest Atlantic. We have ice fish fisheries, small fish, uh, that are, are concentrated in shelf areas around sub-Antarctic islands, and then you have Patagonian toothfish and Antarctic toothfish being exploited uh, throughout the region. In terms of ecosystem-based management, the achievements of Camilla and, and, and uh, how it's progressing is firstly to do with sustainable fisheries. We have precautionary catch limits on all the fisheries. Uh, new and developing fisheries are also managed in a way that it's a slow introduction. We have spatial management, not just the red areas that you saw uh, on the uh, map before. Um, Camilla area is probably a Category 4 protected area in the IUCN system. Uh, we also have uh, roughly 30% of the area is closed to fishing um, to manage the ignorance. In other words, the areas are closed until such time as we know how to manage the fisheries in the open areas so as they can then be introduced into those closed areas. Uh, so um, they are on, only at the moment closed to fishing, uh, but they do account for our learning. We then have bycatch strategies primarily aimed to avoid bycatch. If we can't avoid, we aim to mitigate. And if we can't mitigate, then we establish catch limits. Uh, so it's a stepwise progression in the way we approach bycatch management. One of the great successes of Camilla has been to eliminate the uh, mortality of seabirds in longlining activity. Um, apart from IAU fishing, uh, we have negligible uh, um, longline deaths of seabirds. And also more recently, and this is uh, indicative of the responsiveness of Camilla to emerging issues, uh, there's been a rapid uh, um, uh, establishment of controls on uh, bottom fishing activities, that's both longlining and trawl, which has resulted in all of the uh, shelf areas around Antarctica being closed to bottom fishing. Uh, and there's a, um, 
uh, on the water controls of the uh, long line activities which are basically move on provisions if there is a detection of um, uh, a bucket, basically a bucket of gunk that comes up with the, on the long line. And, and also there's been moves to uh, uh, establish a representative system of uh, protected areas throughout the Antarctic. This is a, uh, a map of the bioregionalization of the Southern Ocean which was undertaken in 2006. And there are now uh, 13 areas on that map which are being targeted for research uh, to put uh, MPAs. <coughs> and then in terms of regulation, as I indicated, all fisheries are regulated. There are a number of port and trade measures that have been established and a whole bunch of compliance and enforcement um, uh, also uh, established in Cameroon. So what's left? Have we done it all? Um, I recently gave a presentation in the Australian Antarctic Division where I work and uh, it was interesting, I, I decided to go back in time and I looked at a book that was written by Jim Barnes, Let's Save Antarctica. It was written in the same year that the first meeting of Camelot occurred and there's a key component in that book which talks about um, what's required to achieve uh, conservation and sustainable use in the Southern Ocean. And if, it could have been written yesterday. And I think the great lesson from reading that book was that um, to achieve ecosystem-based fisheries management, it takes a long time to establish the foundation requirements in order for that to be achieved. Um, and Camelot has made a lot of progress, but we won't start seeing that progress now uh, until uh, you know, some years to come. So what have we done in developing that for krill? I'm going to whip through this for, um, because of time, but I'm quite happy to provide the, uh, the presentation, but also some papers that give this background. Some of the key events then in the, the krill fishery, this is time here. This gives you the um, amount of krill that's been taken by the fishery over time. Just to note that the maximum uh, in the past has been about 700,000 tonnes of krill taken out of the ocean. Uh, in one year, the uh, precautionary catch limits for krill are now set at about 6 million tonnes. Um, so it, it's only ever been small relative to what we think uh, would be a conservative catch limit. We've had established the Camelot Ecosystem Monitoring Program to help detect the effects of fishing and to differentiate those from uh, natural change. And significantly for krill, the um, collapse of the Soviet Union meant that there was room to establish the precautionary approach. We had much less interest in uh, the uh, take of krill by the Soviet Union and as a result we could start to establish some of the more conservation oriented measures. Since then we've had uh, a number of surveys that uh, enabled us to um, establish catch limits around the Antarctic. But significantly since 2000 we've had an agenda to actually establish a management procedure which is based on monitoring uh, feedbacks uh, and also to take account of the different scales of operation of the ecosystem. The krill population operates at a much larger scale than, um, than others. Is that time? Yeah, ten. ten. thank you. Uh, whereas the predators operate at much more local scales and we need to establish procedures that allow for that. So the precautionary approach for krill, which was established 18 years ago, was based on the foundation that we didn't have much knowledge, but we do have estimates of biomass before fishing. We can set up a method for deciding on the catch limit that takes account of uncertainties and particularly establish a target level, some sort of critical threshold level and then some plausible set of scenarios. And the man that wrote the original model is sitting over in the corner, um, <laughs> Andre could easily put up the same sort of map that Billy puts up and say which fisheries have I been involved with? Well this is one of those down in the Antarctic. This was called the krill yield model at the time and I'm going to whip through it because of the lack of time. But basically you set up some scenarios uh, in the simulation environment, you sample the population at the starting point and then establish a catch limit and see what happens to the population over time. You then run this scenario many times varying natural mortality, um, resampling at the beginning of the time series and also taking account of different levels of recruitment variability, growth rates and the like. And in the end you, you have just many, many simulations. Many of us are familiar with this in, in what's now called MSC, but it wasn't called MSC then. Uh, and using a bunch of decision rules coming up with a catch limit. And what these decision rules were then, and they still are, but they're being looked at now, they're starting to be investigated as to whether or not they're correct, uh, is these. Firstly, to safeguard recruitment, which is one of the points, one of the objectives of the convention. 
And in order to take account of uncertainty, there needed to be a 90% chance of not descending below the critical level, which was thought to be this rule of thumb, 20% of the pre-exploitation level. The second rule was to safeguard predators. Because the, the krill was a forage species, it was considered important to leave enough behind for predators. In a single species approach, the tactic would be the target level would be 50%. No fishing would be 100%, uh, and so at the time they split the difference, so 75%. There has been work since which is trying to look at, well, what would be a satisfactory, whoops, satisfactory level. Um, we haven't concluded that work, but uh, the work that's now going on should uh, provide insights to that. And then the aim is you look at the catch that would deliver this outcome, a catch that would deliver that outcome, and then you would choose the lower of the two catch limits. And that's where it has been since 1991. And since then, we've applied that to toothfish, and we've applied that uh, modified version of that to ice fish. Um, we're now starting to move on and starting to look at more uh, uh, different ways that we might be able to manage those fisheries. And you can see the coverage then of the catch limits. There are a couple of areas where we don't have uh, catch limits, but they're closed to fishing until such time as we get the surveys and, and, and work done to be able to establish that. So what's missing from the precautionary approaches in uh, the statistical areas? These are the statistical areas here. One of the key points that has been discussed is that we need to account for predators and what are those predator requirements. And it's recognised that in these small areas here, the predators can concentrate their foraging activity. And you wouldn't wish for the fishery to be solely focusing on any one of those areas because that would seriously impact on the predators that rely on those areas. So in 2002, we subdivided these statistical areas into small-scale management units to take account of the differences between those areas. And there's another important element of, of that subdivision that I'll come to in a moment. We need to be able to look to see what distribution of the fishery do we need in order to ensure for the recovery of, of the whales, uh, particularly the seals seem to be doing pretty well. How do you minimise for localised impacts of fishing? And I'll come to trends in krill in a moment. Lastly, we haven't really looked, and I don't think we are looking yet, about what you would do to actually check if you've made the right decisions to begin with. So the key thing here is what spatial patterns need to be employed in distributing the cruel fishing effort to achieve the conservation objectives more broadly. And these are the key challenges. And I know I'm running out of time now, but you'll understand these anyway. Firstly, uh, uh, one great uncertainty is the status of krill. We use acoustics to measure the abundance of krill, and it's likely that acoustics are underestimating the abundance of krill. So that would suggest that our precautionary approach is indeed precautionary. One of the other key uncertainties is ecosystem structure, function and scale. We know that in high krill years, you, the higher predators rely on krill. But in low krill years, they actually rely on fish in this amphipod chain. Is that this flipping between the two different chains going to be fairly important in understanding what response will happen in the future? One of our greatest uncertainties is knowing the status of the ecosystem relative to the fishery. We've only got four sites where we have time series of monitoring. Our fourth uncertainty is the changes in the Southern Ocean. We've got these changes that were wrought on the Southern Ocean through whaling and sealing and fishing in the past, and now we've got climate change with warming of the ocean and also changing in sea ice extents. And they're going to be profound changes uh, to the ecosystem. And we've also got a change in krill fishery. It's gone from being a net fishery, a trawl fishery, uh, now using pumping methods, the nets can stay in the water for many days and the ships can cruise around hoovering up the krill, if they wish. The last uncertainty, and I actually think this is the greatest uncertainty, and Jake mentioned this before, and Tony did as well. Our greatest uncertainty is how to achieve consensus. What do we actually need to do to achieve consensus and ensure that the black hole of science doesn't lead to great inertia in the system? It's very easy to ask for more science, but how do you get over that? How do you actually say enough is enough, we can now make a decision? And that's one of the biggest challenges we face. So what process can we use to overcome um, that uncertainty in reality? It's always going to be uncertain. And in, in other words, how can we achieve the objectives of Article 2? When that fishery hits 6 million tonnes, are we going to have the right measures in place? And that's the biggest challenge, because we need to be operating at different scales. I've now run out of time, so 
basically what we're doing now is we've set up some simulation environments with food webs that can look at the spatial arrangements of the fishery. Uh, we can start to take account of different scales of effects of the fishery, both on the krill and the predators. And one of the things that I'm asking um, the, the system as we're starting to develop is can we actually use an experimental approach? We've heard it before, the fishery is the greatest manipulation of the ecosystem as we, as we have at present. Can we use these um, areas as open and closed areas to help us learn about the system? This is some of the modelling uh, results of mine. But more importantly, what is the best scientific evidence available is a key question. It's not more data, it's how can we employ science as a tool uh, to help make decisions? What are the climate futures? Learning. I don't think we th think about enough about how do we use the fisheries to help us learn about the way the system is behaving and learn as to which models are actually the right models to use. I think we're still guessing far too much and we should be using the fisheries to help with that. And then there are these other things which are, <coughs> are uh, standards. So thank you very much. Um, that's what we're looking at at present. Through the, um, the work that we've been doing now since 2001 has been a progression from understanding the different scales of the system, uh, developing appropriate models and understanding about what sorts of models you would erect, and therefore understand better the relationships between predators and krill in other parts of the system. And so to understand what the dynamic might be as you introduce the fishery, that's what we're trying to work on and what the spatial distribution would be. I think in terms of addressing the uh, Marine Stewardship Council criteria, I think a lot of those steps are in place. Uh, I think that there will be a requirement for a, a greater observation program. There will be a requirement for uh, establishing a, a monitoring program of the performance of predators relative to krill and so on, uh, to be consistent with the overall approach. But I think the biggest challenge that the, that particular application faces is the, uh, the international environment. Um, it's whether or not you can guarantee in that process cooperation by other nations that are wishing to uh, fish for krill uh, in terms of achieving sustainability. So we've already had illegal fishing for krill. Um, it happened a couple of years ago. Uh, that's been reined in, but uh, nevertheless, I think as the, uh, the market for krill expands, I think you'll find that there'll be, it'll become a very attractive environment.